Hello and welcome to this programme from Bailey Gifford, the latest in a series where we talk to the fund managers of the group's different investment trusts. Today, we're talking to Stephen Pace. Stephen is the co-manager of Bailey Gifford's European Growth Trust and also head of European Equities at Bailey Gifford. My name is Richard Lander of Citywa, and we're going to have a discussion with Stephen for about 25 minutes about how he runs the trust and what's happening now. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, You've been there getting on for four years now at the Trust. It's been quite a roller coaster ride. You've had this period of huge outperformance uh, when you first got there, then the period of underperformance in 21 22. So, how's that been for you looking back? Oh, well, it's clearly been quite difficult. And I think that the first reflection is probably more of an appreciation um, of how difficult it is as an investor um, to manage such kind of volatility um, in your underlying investments. And I, I share the pain with, with a lot of you out there in that most of my savings are actually um, investing in these companies. So I know how nice it is to see things going up in value, uh, but equally I know how unpleasant it can be when you see things um, come down in value very quickly. But I, as you pointed out, I mean, we, we took over the trust um, almost four years ago and I think our aims back then were to <clears throat> basically taking a taking a, an underperforming value orientated investment trust, um, transition it to a portfolio filled with what we think are the most dynamic kind of growth companies in Europe. Uh, we wanted to take the kind of the performance numbers up to the to the kind of the top of the table rather than the bottom of the table, and we wanted to close the discount. Uh, which was stuck at that kind of mid-teens level. And we also wanted to um, add in a little bit of exposure to private companies in Europe, which we can probably come back to. But COVID actually accelerated the achievement of all of those aims, uh, and we, we achieved those aims far quicker than we ever thought. However, as we have seen, um, the kind of the longer, stronger for longer inflation data, the interest rate environment changing very quickly has ultimately led to a, a very quick um, reversal of fortunes um, in the in the in the trust, and basically we're we're back to where we started. I mean, the, the share price of the trust is, is back to kind of the low eighties um, in pence terms. Um, the performance certainly over the last couple of years has been um, pretty poor, um, and obviously we're not happy with that. But I think that when you kind of see performance numbers like this, and this applies to companies or fund managers or portfolios, you, you have to ask yourself whether something has broken or whether this is actually quite a good time um, to take advantage of um, those price movements. And I clearly think we have the, kind of the latter in mind. Um, I think we have the right people. I think we have the right process and philosophy. Um, and I think that we're certainly in a much better place to benefit from the, the sell-off and growth equities at, at this point. And I think that it's often said that you can start building insights um, when you recognize that something just doesn't quite make sense. And I think when I look at the types of businesses that we invest in, um, the their financial profiles, when I think of the people running those businesses, um, the valuations just don't make sense to me. Um, the trust has gone back to trading at a kind of mid-teens um, discount to its NEV. Even if you look at the valuation multiples on an earnings or cash flow basis, the, the multiples of the last couple of years for the fund have fallen by about 50%. And we're still able to show, or the forecast numbers show, that the earnings growth of the portfolio should still be double digit. And this compares to a market which has um, declined in valuation terms or the valuation multiple terms by about 20%, but growth is basically evaporated. You're not really right. getting any earnings growth for the for the um, the index. So, so I think we're in a case where there's kind of classic hyperbolic discounting. Um, investors in the market are pre paying a, a premium for large cap, kind of the perception of safety. And they've overly discounted the profit streams from some of these fantastic growth companies that we have available to us in Europe. So 
that's the thing with the reflection. Um, the, the performance hasn't been good, but given where valuations are now and the opportunities to invest more in these companies, um, the future is certainly looking a lot more optimistic. Great. Uh, it is a difficult time for, uh, a volatile and difficult time for growth investors, not just you, but the audience there. Uh, and indeed, Bailey Gifford is a growth house, if it is anything. How do you keep, remain disciplined and remain focused on that long-term growth philosophy? Because it's a, it's challenging for you, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a lot of volatility in stock markets, uh, and certainly over shorter periods of time, and this is probably more driven by emotional buying and selling and changing of, of risk appetites. It, it rarely has much to do with fundamentals, which, which is what we're focused on. This is growth in revenue, growth in earnings and cash flow. Um, so I, th I think that, that that's where we are just now. Um, but the reality is that the more volatility there is, the, the higher chance of us actually finding mispriced assets. But as you pointed out, it has been tough for long-term growth investors. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of them started changing their investment philosophies to try and catch up in performance. But I think that's the very worst thing that, that you could possibly do at this time. And in fact, if you, if you see us do that, you should probably sell the shares and sell the funds immediately. Right. But I think there are various factors which help us remain disciplined. And I think the first one is obviously the institutional framework and structure that we have at Bailey Gifford, which remains to this day over a hundred years ago, it was founded and remains to be as an independent partnership, which is quite rare these days. So we don't have any external shareholders. We're not going to be doing any big, big distracting um, acquisitions. Uh, staff turnover remains very, very low. We're constantly reinvesting in the business. And we invest the way we, we want to, which is to find the best growth companies in Europe and, and hold them for very long periods of time. And that's, that could be 10 years, could that's be 20 years, it could be 30 years. We have a very strong belief in the philosophy. And, and again, it's based on being long-term, keeping that turnover low. It's being low cost. Um, and you can see that from the, the fees that we, we charge. And we want to manage portfolios with high active shares. So the portfolios that we're managing look very different to the index. And we, again, strongly believe that stock prices are going to be driven by fundamentals over longer periods of time. And that's why when you look at the characteristics of the portfolios that we manage, the companies that we have grow their sales and their earnings faster than the market. They have stronger balance sheets in the market. We have a higher percentage of companies in the portfolio that are managed and owned by families and, and founders. And I think maybe the, the, the final thing is that while this kind of drawdown feels quite um, extreme, it's quite a difficult situation to deal with, we are very aware that even the best fund managers and the best companies regularly experience drawdowns. All right. We've been investing in Europe since 1985. We have gone through market cycles like this before, and we have always rebounded. Some of our best performing companies over the last 10 or 20 years have fallen 40, 50% on numerous occasions. But it's not simply been reversion. Um, but when these kind of occurrences happen, it normally is a good time to, to invest. Now, it's much harder to predict the timing of that rebound and the turnaround, but I can be much more confident in the overall direction. And I think that's certainly hopefully going to be positive. Right. I mean, you are doing this against the background of a Europe, uh, a European economy that's on the edge of a recession. It might be there already. Uh, and obviously you're very company focused, but the environment doesn't help even if it's, you know, putting investors off. Uh, investing in Europe, great companies or not? Yeah, I mean, that that, that perception, uh, I mean, maybe it's more of a reality now with, with Europe um, and the underlying economy, which is, which is pretty weak, certainly relative to some of those other regions. Um, but you could have said the same for the European economy over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, it's just now that we have maybe slightly higher for, for longer rates. Inflation is, is, again, maybe slightly stickier. Europe's had more of a problem from 
um, higher energy prices with its um, proximity to, to what's happened in Ukraine. Excuse me. Um, and that has led, again, to this, this very negative perception of, of Europe as an asset class. And we can see that from the outflows. I mean, we, we have seen persistent outflows from the, the European asset class um, for quite some time now. But this is becoming reflected in the valuation. Now, we're not investing in the European market, um, thankfully, um, but even the European index is now trading at the biggest discount on a, a PE basis or any other multiple versus the US um, ever. So I think that discount has now widened to such an extreme level that hopefully we are going to start seeing a bit more interest in those investors trying to pick up more bargains and trying to take advantage right. of this negative per perception. So, so yeah, I, I think these economic headwinds are there, but what we're trying to find are companies that, that can grow throughout these conditions, that they can grow throughout um, many different market environments. So we're trying to find companies that are grow growing um, where the growth is not dependent solely on European GDP. Now, we have lots of industrials which are maybe exposed to that, but most of these industrials will also be able to consolidate very fragmented markets. These are financially strong companies like Alex Copco, Kingspan, um, IMCD. We're looking for companies that have resilience and whether it's from an inflation, we want companies that have genuine pricing power. So we have a number of companies um, in the luxury goods space. We have Wishmall, which owns um, Carti. We have Caring, which owns Gucci. We now have Montclair. Um, we have some online classifieds businesses, which have fantastic pricing power. We've got tech companies like ASML. It's effectively a, a monopoly, which has very good pricing power as well. And the other part of that resilience equation is, is having a very strong balance sheet. And right the way through, even before COVID, all the way through COVID and today, especially, the companies that we manage um, or invest in have lower levels of debt than the underlying markets. And this right. is because those companies appreciate the, the, the benefits of having strong balance sheets, particularly when the economy turns. So we want that growth to be structural, acquisitive. We're not necessarily pinning your hopes in any kind of cycle turning around. We want companies that are resilient and adaptable. So as I said before, most of the companies we invest in, we want to invest in for 5, 10, 20 years and beyond. And to do that, you have to trust the people managing those businesses for us. And most of those companies, we do trust the owners. Um, there's normally a, a significant inside owner a family or founder um, and these are the companies these are the people that we are effectively allocating the, the decisions to from a capital allocation standpoint and right. we trust them so so those are the things we we look for and those are the things that help mitigate some of the problems from the underlying economy great let's drill down into the portfolio and let's first talk about the shape of it because obviously you want every company to to be a great asset in your portfolio but do you look at it from a you know a 360 point of view looking at the portfolio how is it balanced how are they the the, the different investments working with each other absolutely um the, the the portfolio we have we have guidelines we want to have between 6 30 and 60 companies um, we're not going to have more than a 10% position in any one company. We, we want to have sufficient diversification across those companies, and we do have that. Um, but when we kind of think of the exposures that we have, we, we are growth managers, so we are going to be biased towards certain sectors. And these certain sectors and industries have proven to be very successful at providing kind of big winners in the past. Um, it may not be the same in the future, but we're kind of working towards that, but these sectors would include healthcare. So we have some of the best med tech names in Europe. Um, obviously, luxury goods. We, we have a collection of the best luxury goods companies in Europe. Semiconductor manufacturing, 
um, companies that are helping Europe and the world decarbonize. So as we think from, from the top down holistically, we have what we think are the right bets to, to structural themes and growth drivers that are going to persist over the next kind of five, 10 and, and years and beyond. So we're quite happy with the shape of the portfolio. Um, we have, of course, weeded out some companies. Um, not everything has worked out clearly, um, but we have weeded out some of those companies where we didn't think the execution um, and the operational progress wasn't just quite there. Or some of the companies that maybe the financial position wasn't quite as strong as we, we wanted it to be. Um, an example of that would have been Embracer, which is a Swedish um, gaming company. And I think that in hindsight, that was a company which um, probably bit off more than it could chew through its acquisition strategy and it is struggling a little bit um, with how to fund a lot of the games and IP it has. So, excuse me, that's one where we decided that both from a trust angle and from a financial strength um, point of view, um, it was worth just selling, taking the hit and moving on to some better things. So I think broadly the, the shape of the portfolio is where we want it. Um, we're clearly in a very different situation than we were in 2021 with in hindsight, which was the, the, the peak of the market when valuations were, were much higher. Um, interest rates are near, if not at the, the peak of the, the, the cycle. And inflation is more likely than not to stabilize or, or keep coming down a little. And all of these things will be supportive of growth investing. And we've looked at previous cycles where um, that point of peak inflation, when you see kind of inflation and interest rates, see the stabilizer come down. This is the time that equities in general, but more so growth equities tend to outperform. So yes, we have those kind of features um, and characteristics that we, we want in the portfolio. Um, we're, we're happy with the shape of it. We're happy with the people running those companies. And as I said at the start, the, the valuations now are much more appealing um, and if you think about the probabilities of doubling from here for the next five years. Right. Uh, let's just drill down a bit further. Uh, you talked about the shape of the portfolio, but the actual holdings, the top three listed holdings, uh, when I had a look at your latest fact sheet, I mean, how varied are they? You've got Process, which is all about tech, Ryanair. We all know about that. We've probably all flown on it, for better or worse. And Topicus, which is an acquirer of small software companies. Uh so what's the what's the common thread running through these these companies? The I mean the, the common theme, I mean, as I said, we, we have a diversified portfolio. So I, I think sometimes the perception of portfolios at Bailey Gifford is that the, the vast majority is invested in loss making tech or biotech companies. We have a broad approach to, to growth investing. Um, there are many ways to double your investment over a five-year period or more. Um, and some of those might be more cyclical. Some of those might be perceived to be slightly more defensive, but actually through acquisitions or the market share gains, they are able to, to compound earnings at a very attractive rate. Um, and, and taking those top three companies that you mentioned there, uh, I mean, process is a consumer technology holding company. I mean, it listed in Europe in 2019, so it's not been around that long. Um, and its structure is very much like an investment trust. It has a collection of assets, the biggest of which being a 25% stake in Tencent. Um, Tencent has been always a very large Chinese gaming and um, advertising and social media platform with probably over 1.3 billion users now. Uh, and Tencent accounts for about 85% of the NEV uh, process. Um, so the reasons that we own process are that, firstly, we think Tencent, given it's such a big portion of its portfolio, is it, cheap and its profitable growth has been um, mispriced. I mean, Tencent is, is absolutely integral to, to Chinese society and, and life and the ability in the coming years for Tencent to slowly monetize that user base, I think has been underappreciated. 
Then the second part, which is more of the kind of the, the, the cherry on top, is that process trades at a 40% discount to the NEV it has. Uh, and we expect that to narrow. Now, when, when you kind of take those two components, Tencent, which we think is mispriced, and process, which is trading at a big discount, and then you can invest that through our own investment trust, which is trading on a quite wide discount as well. It's almost like you're getting a discount on a discount on a discount. So th there are strong valuation reasons for, for, for why we own this and most of the other companies in the portfolio. As you mentioned, Ryanair, everybody's probably flown in Ryanair. Um, and despite, the again, the perceptions of people that have lost a bag or whatever else, it's actually the largest, most efficient, and most punctual airline in, in Europe. Its corporate culture is ruthlessly focused on low cost. And what sometimes is forgotten is that Ryanair passes these cost savings on to passengers. And that is why airfares over the last decade in Europe haven't actually increased much at all. And that's not the case in other regions like, like the US where the prices have actually gone up quite a lot. In Europe, they've basically stayed flat for a decade, which is, which is brilliant, um, particularly from a value perspective. Now, because of that, and because of the lower, lowest unit costs that they have, they've been able to take market share consistently year after year. And we think this is going to be the case for the next decade. So, so Ryanair, lots of people have kind of personal anecdotes and everything else, but as a business and a corporate culture, it is quite unique and it's trading at a very, very low valuation, much lower than it has done in the past. And then topic is, again, is it's a different um, business in a different industry, um, but it has the same characteristics that we want in all of these investments. Um, it's relatively unknown, actually. I mean, topic is as you pointed out, is a consolidator of vertical market software businesses. Now, it was actually spun out of a company called Constellation Software, which is a Canadian business, very famous, very successful business, um, which does exactly the same, but in North America. Now, Topic is, is the European version of that, but it's listed in Canada, but the headquarters are in Europe, and basically there's no investment bank coverage on this whatsoever but this is a company acquiring small niche software businesses across Europe and um, these software businesses could be involved in anything from accounting software to dental booking systems um, to software to manage golf courses or, or hairdressers um, these are relatively small markets but they each have very high market shares and very sticky customers. So they generate a huge amount of cash. And this cash is being redeployed into hoovering up lots and lots of small acquisitions in this space. So as I said, it has everything that we look for in terms of growth and barriers to entry, cash generation. Um, it has an inside, several inside owners, which create that kind of alignment and crucially, a very low in our opinion valuation. So those are just kind of the, the, the snapshots of the top three, but I could give you the same story for pretty much every company in the portfolio now in terms of the valuation opportunity. Excellent. Uh, so that's great. We've, we've dealt to a certain extent with the listed companies there. Let's turn to the unlisted ones uh, that you invest in. I think it's around 10 or 11% of the portfolio. Uh, and particularly, let's talk about Northvolt. Because if there's a company that really sort of reflects where we're going as a global economy and, and the, the transition to uh, electric cars, very controversial at the moment, it's Northvolt. Huge capital investment, just announced a new plant in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, unlisted, might list next year. How's your experience been of backing this this company from, from quite a small operation to what, what could be something very big? I mean, so far it's been great because um, the the company is progressing in terms of its ambitions. But before I maybe talk about Northvolt, it's, it's probably worth just again reiterating why we're even bothering with with private companies because 
I think in the current environment, um, investment trusts which have exposure to private companies have, again, the perception of uh, mispricing and, and which is maybe leading to some of the wider discounts that we've seen in the sector. But the reason that we have exposure to, to private companies and from the point of taking over the trust of zero, we have the ability and capacity to take up to 20% um, of assets and invest those in private companies. We're now, as you said, about 11%. Um, we have Northolt, which is the largest position. It's about 5%. And the other kind of 5 or 6% is invested across um, four other companies. We, we have Sender, which is a digital free forwarder. We have Flix um, Billity or Flix Bus, which is a, an asset light bus and train operator. We have McMackler, which is a digital real estate broker. And, and now more recently, we have an Italian software company called Bending Spoons. So that's the kind of the, the, the exposure we have. It's not 30%, it's not 50%, it's just over 10%. Um, which to us is, is about the right number for the time being. But the, the reason that we wanted to give investors access to this is that some of the most dynamic and asset light and probably in the future most successful companies are choosing to remain private. And these companies, we can see from the, the age or the vintages of these companies when they're coming to the market, they're, they're now much older. And... As an investment trust, we have potentially permanent capital, so we can handle the illiquid nature of unlisted um, companies. They're, they're not traded openly in public markets. Um, we really want to democratise access to, to companies like Northfolk and, and to give investors the chance of investing in these uh, amazing enterprises. And, and just because they're private doesn't mean that investors shouldn't be able to get access to them. And, and I think our edge in the private company space may even be stronger than, than it is in the public access and um, public markets because of preferential access. Um, a lot of these private companies, the, the best ones, are effectively in a place where they can choose who they want to invest. And fortunately, we have a very strong reputation as being long-term shareholders. And through these investment trusts, we do not need to sell out when a company becomes public at that IPO point. We can continue to hold an investment in a company both privately and as it becomes public, which founders um, really appreciate, which is giving us a bit of an edge when it comes to idea generation. But as you said, um, I think kind of the litmus test for for what we're trying to do here and give exposure to what will come from North Holt and potentially even Flix, which is the other company which is rumored to um, list next year. But but North Holt effectively is a, a Swedish battery manufacturer it was set up in 2015 by a couple of guys who originally had, had been working in Tesla. So they know a thing or two about working in a high pressured engineering um, environment. And they, they were brought in by a couple of Swedish entrepreneurs to, to help solve one of the, the greatest challenges that we have at the moment, which is decarbonization, uh, and principally through um, electric vehicles and battery storage. And, it, and it's very clear that the, the battery market is going to be absolutely enormous. And it's not just electric vehicles, cars and trucks. As I said, there will be a huge market for and energy storage as well. And it's also extremely clear, especially if you think about the geopolitical situation that we're in currently, that Europe needs to have its own battery champion. And that is because European auto OEMs, whether it's Volkswagen, BMW, Porsche, and so on, um, whether it's European um industrial businesses we do not want to have to rely on asian manufacturers mm. so this is why north Fold is being supported in many ways by these european customers it could be through direct investment themselves or it could be through massive orders for um upcoming supply and support from european politicians which is going to be very important 
I actually visited um, North Fort a few weeks ago. Um, I traveled with a couple of colleagues up to the north of Sweden, just near the Arctic Circle. And, and this is where North Fort's kind of main factory or its first factory is it's in a place called Paleftia. So you have to kind of fly up there. It's in the middle of nowhere, but the sheer scale of the factory and the recycling plan and everything that's being integrated into that facility is it, just remarkable. Um, it, it really is quite incredible. And I've seen lots of factories. I've done lots of these tours, but what, what they've achieved and what they're planning to achieve from here on it, it is quite special. So there are clear reasons for it being up there in the north of North of Sweden, they're benefiting from very low cost green mm -hmm. hydroelectric power. And this is kind of the USP. Um, they're going to offer some of the lowest cost batteries in the world, but crucially, they're also going to be the greenest batteries in the world. Partly because the, the percentage of recycled materials that are going into them, but also because of the way um, that the energy is generated to actually manufacture these. So I don't know when it's going to IPO. As you said, there are some rumors it's going to be next year, depending on market conditions. But given how strategic this is, or how strategically important this is um, for Europe as a whole to have this succeed, it'll be very interesting to see um, how this pans out next year. It's certainly going to be extremely high profile. Excellent. Uh, we're going to go to Q&A in a second. Before we do, uh, the title of this uh, webinar, is it time to go bargain hunting? I'm thinking your answer is yes. I mean, I, yes. I, I think that when we think of the, the sell-off in long-duration growth equities, and as I mentioned, the, the valuation multiple is falling 50% across the, the, the whole portfolio with, within individual companies, we've just seen an even more extreme sell-off. And I know it's hard because investors don't necessarily get direct access to some of these companies. From our perspective, speaking to these companies, seeing their operational progress, seeing the kind of the, the position they're in in terms of balance sheets and everything else, it does seem that many companies in the areas that we're investing in have been excessively marked down. So we're taking advantage of that. So we're adding more to some of those names that have sold off. Um, we're also taking the opportunity to, to add new names to the portfolio. Some names um, like Eurofins. Eurofins is a French lab testing business, which has kind of grown 20% per annum for the last kind of decade. We've been waiting a number of years to buy Eurofins. It was just that the, the valuation up until that now had been too expensive in our view. So we've taken advantage of that. We have numerous other examples where the, the share prices and valuations have fallen um, 40, 50% as well. And we've just been patient and we're picking up these, these assets now at what we think are, are, are bargain prices. Now, we may have to wait a couple of years or five years for all of these kind of growth profiles and, and return characteristics to be appreciated by the market. But that is the opportunity. We, we think yeah. we'll be given a much better opportunity today to invest and generate value for the next five or 10 years than we have certainly in the last few. Excellent. Let's go to some Q&A now. Uh, and we've got some really good questions come in. Uh, one uh, says, the discount suggests that the market doesn't believe in the trust. Uh, what, in your opinion, can get people back buying the trust again? It's, it's simply performance. And when the, the performance has, to a very great extent, been driven by central banks and the narrative of um, this interest rate cycle. And we, we, we had some questions recently about, okay, can you tell us a bit more about the performance in, in August, September, even July, the, in the summer? But the reality is that the performance of the fund, whether it goes up or down over the last few months and certainly over the last year and a half, has been driven by the market's view of where we are in the interest rate cycle. I think once investors have more confidence that we have genuinely reached that kind of peak and we're not going to see any more 
derating and sell off of growth equities, I think that's when they're going to start um, hopefully coming back. But we've invested in many holding companies for many years. And when markets kind of sell off, you tend to see discounts widen. But, but to me, if you're buying into a, a high quality selection of, of underlying companies and that's in a, a wrapper, which is also trading at a big discount, um, that, that's normally a good time to, to get involved. Now, it, it's hard because most retail investors will buy the best performing funds and they'll sell the, the underperforming ones. But, but the reality is you should be doing the other way around. Um, if you believe in the philosophy and if you believe in the process, um, if nothing is broken, this is normally quite a good time um, to take advantage of those um, inefficiencies. Excellent. A couple of questions about Northvolt coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Firstly, uh, and I'll, I'll take this, these together, what are the pol political risks associated with some investments such as Northvolt? And, and secondly, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a private company, so we don't have full purview of their financials, but uh, what's happening with their valuation in terms of, of, of the sort of multiples that you might apply to a to a listed company? I mean, the, polit the political risks, um, I, I think the political situation, I mean, we, we, we clearly have this kind of tension um, in global trade, and it's not just the US and China, it's where Europe fits in that that, that puzzle as well. Um, so the, the, the environment in which the European regulators are capable of price tariffs, import tariffs, and, and maybe protectionism, if you want to call it that, I, I think that could be a risk, but it's probably more a benefit and as I said, when you have political capital and and the will to protect something within Europe, it's normally a good thing. And unfortunately, we've not had a huge amount of that over the last 10, 15 years, where the, the government and, and states and politicians have stepped in to try and support something like this. Um, the European semiconductor industry was effectively wiped out. The, the European solar industry was effectively wiped out but from what we've seen so far there is definitely more um, political goodwill towards north Volts and subsidies and everything else that we would want coming in now it's now in a case where actually it's a bit more of a bun fight to to get north Volt to invest so this is the point where north Volt, as you mentioned is now going to open up another facility it's got a number of different facilities in Europe, but it's got to open up another large facility in Canada. And that is simply because the, the incentives given to North Volt in terms of grants are much greater in the US and Canada than they are perhaps in Europe. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing for North Volt. Um, if, if governments are fighting over themselves to try and give you money to, to, to open up manufacturing plants then then that's quite a good thing so i think the political risks are are there in terms of, of tariffs and, and um, imports and everything else but i think net net it's probably a positive yeah. in this case and then in, te in terms of the, the the valuation um i mean the unfortunate thing with private companies in, in many ways is that we are um bound by confidential confidentiality agreement. So we, we can't talk too much about the the, the valuations here. Um, you will be able to read in newspapers and everything else that the the kind of the funding round a couple of years ago implied that the valuation was kind of in the low teens, it was probably eleven billion dollars or something, something in that range. Now Northvolt is progressing. And we can monitor their progress in terms of the, the output. It's normally measured in gigawatt hours, but there, there are numerous other similar, well, they're not numerous, there are a couple of other battery companies that have a similar output to what Northvolt are going to be in a good place to, to provide. Um, and you can use a valuation 
kind of a, a billion dollar number per gigawatt hours type thing. But it's not inconceivable that you could see North Fault being valued at 50, 60, 70, 100 billion by the end of the decade. Now, th there are a range of outcomes. Um, manufacturing at this scale is not easy. There will be inevitably some hiccups and some delays and everything else, but th there is definitely the range of outcomes that we would want in a company in terms of that asymmetry. So I, I think until we have, or until you have the access that you will get when Northwell becomes a public company, you will then be able to see the financial profile. Um, I, you could probably guess that it's going to be loss making in the beginning. Um, I think that's that's pretty clear as they kind of ramp up that manufacturing process. But you can work out what a typical um, return yep. of capital or a margin of this type of business will be. Oh, that, there's a KPI that probably most of us have never heard of before. Uh, one more question about a company, and then uh, and that's about Adyen and a, a mm. horrible time for the payments tech se sector. Uh, you still a believer in Ad Adyen and its potential? Yes, and I was surprised. I mean, for for those that maybe are less familiar, Ad Adyen is a um, a Dutch digital payment processing business. And it's, it's one of the, again, most dynamic companies in Europe in that it was growing 25 to kind of 30%. And it's got a relatively low market share. So it had years and years of growth, highly profitable growth to, to come. Um, it was generating kind of 55, 60% operating margin. So, so this is a company that had growth, that had the, the type of profits that, that we want now. More recently, it gave um, its quarterly or half yearly update and showed that the growth rates had slowed a little. So they, they missed the expectations in the market, not by much, but this was the first time, for instance, Adyen had grown less than 20%. I think the actual number came in about 19%. And that has clearly spooked the market. And this has raised questions about the level of competition in the US, which was where most of the issue was, with companies being a bit more, let's say, irrational or aggressive on, on price. And Adyen's position is that, okay, they, they, they should have done a better job at explaining to their customers the value proposition of what they're offering, because Adyen as a, as a payments processor can offer the lowest total cost of ownership to these customers. It's just that in the current environment, many of the large online customers yeah. just wanted to save money because every, everybody in that kind of space is in a growth to profit dynamic. They, they want to show shareholders that they, they can improve margins at any cost. So basically, we, we think that this is more of a temporary phenomenon than anything structural, but the market has clearly panicked and is worried about these competitive dynamics moving to Europe, which is a much more complex market, which suits Adyen. Adyen is exceptional at solving complex payment problems for its customers. And in Europe, with the number of different currencies and different countries and all sorts of other things going on regulations, it's a much more complex market. But the market is worried that the, the, the temporary problems that we've seen are going to kind of um, creep into into Europe. Into Europe. We've spoken to PayPal, we've spoken to Stripe, we've spoken to a lot of other cu customers and competitors. Um, and while there are some question marks about the kind of uh, what, what's happening from a price perspective, we're we're still fairly comfortable with the longer term prospects for something like Adyen. But I haven't seen a company sell off that much. Not not to the, the extent that Adyen did with, with the qualities that Adyen has. Um, I mean, it sold off almost 50% in a nope. week. And I have not seen that before in Europe unless it was involved in fraud, which I don't think it is here, or it was going to go bust. And neither of those, I think, apply to, apply to Adyen. So we're going to have to wait and see for them to, to prove to the market and to those other investors that 
these issues have been temporary and there's nothing to worry yeah. about in months. It's a very unforgiving environment right now. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's uh, joined in watching and for your questions. We do have more sessions like this coming up with Bailey Gifford. So please do keep an eye out for them uh, if you found today's useful. So uh, thank you very much to Stephen and to, uh, and to all of you for attending. And we'll see you again soon. <laughs>